Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today's lecture, we will discuss a case study that documents the permeability of the divide between the internal world of science and the external world. Then we will see how uh, the sites of scientific knowledge production shifted from public institutions and academia to the private industrial corporations. We will also see that the academic science has been undergoing a cultural revolution. We will have a look at the new institutional context of knowledge production that came into existence uh, in the wake of the WTO WTO's provisions on intellectual property rights. So what are the implications of the IPRs on knowledge production and the culture of science, right? Uh, what are the implications of IPRs for knowledge production and, it, and the culture of science? These are some of the issues we are going to look at today. Permeability between the two worlds, it means basically we have seen earlier that uh, one view was that the internal world of science and the external world of science are uh, divided and the divide is quite rigid. But today we are going to see that it is not the case. It is the divide is permeable and a lot of uh, exchange between the two worlds. This intersection has made the classical distinction between science and technology. Uh, has brought technology under the ambit of science studies as well. As modern scientific knowledge advanced and intersects with technology, uh, uh, which makes the divide between internal world of the science and the external world of science become more permeable and or porous. Thus, the state, market and civil society become interacting elements and this interaction appears to raise several issues relating to science and science and state, science and market, science and civil society. This becomes an arena of tensions between fact and value as well. Let me first give you the, uh, present the case study, as I said. It is a case study done by Bruno Latour. He worked on Pasteur's work in the 19th century. And uh, he documented what Pasteur did uh, while he uh, while he was trying to look at the diseases that were afflicting the cattle. Bruno Latour points out that scholars who specialize in macro level studies of science, like science policy, find that the micro level laboratory studies do not contribute to better understanding of science for policy making. Latour's study of Pasteur's work is an example of how the internal world of science and the external world of science interact. He argues that one should not make the distinction between macro level and micro level studies of science and technology uh, in the context of society. So Bruno Lotto starts by giving the picture of around 1881. He said there was an outbreak of uh, disease among the cattle population in 1881 France. Many cattle died, the cause of which the farmers could not understand. The government, veterinarians, the press, and of course the interested uh, farmers were, finding, were trying to find out the cause. It is in this context, Pasteur intervened and shifted the lab to his far farmers' fields to understand what was the problem. He collected the samples of diseased tissue from the affected cattle and carried the samples over to his lab in Paris. After finding the cause, he transmitted the result of his research, which revealed that the disease was caused by anthrax bacillus, and he developed a vaccine to immunize the cattle against anthrax. Uh, this is pictorially given the, what moves that Pasteur made according to Bruno Latour. As I said, uh, Bruno Lott Pasteur was sitting uh, happily in a lab laboratory in Paris where they did not have much interest in cattle, much interest in farmers' problems. But when it was brought to his notice, then he moved to farmers' fields. 
he shifted his lab to the farmer's fields for collection of sample from the deceased uh, cattle. Then the samples were moved to the laboratory in France uh, for research. And this research leads to, the, uh, to finding the cause. And then after finding the cause, what he did was, again, the result was fed back to the farmers like this. And farmers knew what was happening. And he also developed a vaccine uh, which, could, which could be used uh, against the disease. As I said, Pasteur's moves, move number one, to capture the interests of relevant social groups, farmers, government, veterinarians, and the media, he transfers himself and his laboratory into the farmer's world who never saw the lab. Move two, he transfers the samples of anthrax bacilli from the field to his lab where he translates the problem into a research problem and investigates it. He only removes one element from the farmer's forms in which are not visible to farmers because the bacillus was such a microorganism uh, in the body of the cattle which farmers could not see. He takes the samples and cultivates the bacilli in a laboratory to find out what the bacilli look like, uh, which could not be seen in farmers' field as anthrax was part of uh, several other microorganisms in the bodies of the cattle. This is how he asserts his authority and tells people if they want to find a solution, they have to go through his laboratory first. He finds the cause of the disease as anthrax bacilli and develops artificial vaccine. This is the case study which Bruno Lotto reports uh, in one of his research papers. He argues um, Pasteur's lab is now in the middle of agricultural interests with which it had no relation before. In the forms, an element coming from Paris, like vaccine flasks, has been added. Veterinary doctors have modified their status by promoting pasture signs and vaccine flasks. They now possess one more weapon in their black, black bags, and sheep and cows, or sheep and cows are free, uh, freed from a terrible death. They can give more milk and more wool to the farmer and slaughtered with great profit. So uh, this is an example of how the external world of science, that is, in this case, the government, the farmers, the veterinarians, the press, uh, they were interested uh, in, in finding out what pasture is going to do with the samples which he took from the field. And uh, that's how pasture brought the interests of all these groups like farmers, veterinarians, the government, press, into his laboratory. And that means the external world was brought into the laboratory and he provided solution to the problem. Similarly, what's happening today is, uh, is also, can also be seen, uh, similar things can be seen in today's context of genetic engineering of crops. The motivation underlying genetically, engineer, genetically engineering crops by the industrial corporations basically are profits and they would like to control technology. The external world of science interests of farmers, the government, regulatory agencies interact with the internal world of science that, that is molecular biology and biotechnology. And most of the research in the case of genetic engineering today is being done by private industrial corporations and public institutions very rarely uh, are found in this uh, kind of a new kind of a research. Scientists working on genetic engineering of crops cannot say that they have nothing to do with this outside world and they are involved in doing sound science. A science, scientist working on genetic modification of rice or wheat or mustard would bring the interests of rice cultivators, wheat cultivators and mustard cultivators, government, consumers and regulators and the society at large into the laboratory. If he doesn't attach any value to what he's doing, uh, people ask questions, why is he doing that kind of research? It is in this context, John Zeman, who, was, uh, uh, who made important contributions to sociology of science, he wrote a paper in Nature. The title is, Is Science Losing Objectivity? Zeman argues that science has been undergoing cultural revolution from academic science to post-academic science. According to Zeman, 
academic science followed certain Mertonian norms like disinterestedness. Uh, but he observed that the culture of science uh, today is guided by norms such as profit, uh, safety, efficacy, rather than Mertonian norms like disinterestedness. That is a very character of science has undergone change. The culture of science has undergone change. It is also because science has become gradually industrialized. That is, today's uh, industries employ have their own R&D research and development departments, and they employ a lot of scientists and engineers and as part of research and development. Now, the goals of the industry are very very different from the goals of an academia. Goals of academia, academic. Uh, institutions try to do research to uh, understand the phenomenon and see how they can contribute to advancement of knowledge. The industry wants to uh, generate knowledge with the idea of using it for production, using it in the production uh, process. Now, as a result of this, today we see what is called a mode to production. The reason for this revolution is industrialization of science, as just now mentioned. The industrial interests would emphasize more on efficacy and profits. Research and development in, for ex in corporations, for example, would emphasize how to make drugs on a large scale and mark make profit. The idea of mode to production was given by Gibbons and others. Uh, they argue further R&D laboratories have also become sites of production of knowledge in addition to the academia. This trend is described as, as I said, mode to production by Gibbons and his colleagues. The debate that is going on currently uh, is whether the universities should do basic research or patentable applied research. The debate today is on the mandate of the universities, whether they should engage in pursuit of basic science or applied science with an eye on patents or a combination of both. This has implications for the culture of academia. For example, uh, if they're pursuing industrial interests, if they find out that there is uh, the research that they have done as patent potential, then they may not publish it until a proof of the concept is arrived at, and it may cause delays in publication, especially in the case of universities. When this research is funded by industry, under a memorandum of understanding, industry would say that if there is a patentable result that cannot be published. And now this kind of uh, agreement can affect the career of students who are also involved in the research. After all, university research is done by graduate students and they also should get, they also get credit for the kind of research that's being done. Now this can change the uh, culture of academia in the sense Scientists may want to do more and more patentable research rather than pursuing basic research because they realize patents can get them rewards. The US government passed the Bedole Act in 1980, according to which inventions, products or processes uh, that resulted from research supported by public funds can be licensed to entrepreneurs for commercial production. It means this licensing is done according to certain norms. As part of the licensing, the uh, money, the, the kind of license fee that is paid by the entrepreneur, part of it goes to the inventor, that is scientist, and part of it goes to the university or academic institution where this research was done. Sometimes uh, uh, the entrepreneur invites the scientist to join the industry so that he can take forward the kind of a proof of concept to produce a product which can be commercially sold. The external world of science, as I said, the, in continuation of the trend of industrialization of science, the new institutional context of knowledge production ushered in by WTO provisions on the IPRs uh, indicate science which was hitherto a public resource uh, became an intellectual property. All the countries are signatories to the WTO. The state apparatus and legal institutions are involved in protecting the IPRs in every country. What is intellectual property? 
any invention that can be converted into a product or process which can be commercialized. The IP is accorded a patent and the patent is protected by the law. What is a patent? I just now mentioned the patent is recognition of the novelty of an invention and the novelty is protected by law against infringement. That is unauthorized use by others without taking permission or compensating the inventor. The protection is given for a specific period ranging from 17 to 20 years in a given country or countries. What is patentable or criteria of awarding a patent? A product or process should be non-obvious, it should involve an inventive step and it should have utility. Under the WTO, the patent regime is a product patent regime. Both the product and processes are protected. Let me give an example from India where, see, Indian case, the Process Patent Act of 1970, the Patent Act of 1970 protected the process but not the product. What it means is that one uh, uses a different process to produce the same product. In the sense, for example, if a company A produces aspirin drug by using one process, company B can produce aspirin by using another process in this case, infringement of patent in this case, because they followed different processes, although they produce the same kind of a drug. This act enabled the Indian pharmaceutical industry to grow and compete internationally. Now, India is also a signatory to the WTO trade, trade-related intellectual property rights, and hence has to follow the new regime or new rules which protects both the processes and products. It means that company A's product mentioned above cannot be produced by any other company. Countries like India now have to follow the new IPRs, IPR regime and accordingly gear up to produce novel products and establish institutional mechanisms to protect IPRs. Now, there is also a debate over IPRs. Intellectual, prop intellectual property rights. There are two views on IPRs. One, patents are incentives to inventors for the intellectual effort and the time they devoted to produce the invention. By protecting the patents, scientists and technologists will be encouraged to produce inventions, more inventions that can be converted into products and processes. This is one view which says that uh, there must be incentive for people who invent. If there is no incentive, uh, people will not be motivated to produce inventions. The second uh, view, patents establish monopoly control over knowledge and to gain access to knowledge, one has to pay, especially in the context where the entire research process, most of the research process has been uh, concentrated in private industrial corporations. Those who cannot afford to pay would not have access to the knowledge or products. However, governments of the countries which find a particular innovation useful to their economy may insist on compulsory licensing. It means the company that owns a patent would be required to give a formal license to the companies in the country to produce the product for a fee. Now, this is used in most of the uh, cases like uh, Medicines, most of the cases which, where uh, the products are extremely useful to the uh, population and uh, so on. Similarly, the BT cotton seed has been licensed by Monsanto company to several Indian companies for production. As I said, for, for example, BT cotton seed is the proprietary product of Monsanto company, an American industrial corporation. It has given license to companies in countries like India to produce BT cotton seed so that the farmers have access to the technology. Again, the technology fees is built into the cost of the seed and every time a farmer buys the seed, he pays the technology fees. BT cotton seed is a genetically modified seed that has a toxic protein transferred from Bacillus thuringiensis, that is BT. And this protein kills the bollworm, a pest that attacks cotton plant, 
and this pest attacks was to minimize pest attacks this uh, protein was uh, engineered into cotton plant the logic is that if the plant itself has this toxic protein if the bollworm attacks the uh, cotton plant by eating cotton plant the bollworm will die and uh, there is that's how you control the population of bollworm Genetic engineering is a technique that allows transfer of genes from one organism to another ac across taxonomic groups. So genetic engineering also raised controversies. As I said, when science moves or when science, the internal world of science, external world of science interact, there are also tensions. We have seen that the scientific controversies are resolved through negotiations to produce consensual knowledge. That is, uh, in the last lecture I told you that even within science, the controversy, scientific controversies with respect to uh, explanations regarding phenomena uh, are resolved by a kind of a mobilization of consensus through negotiations. In the sense, normally uh, explanations or several explanations are advanced, several explanations are provided to look at the relationship between two phenomena. But how does, how is it that one explanation gets selected as against other? This is through a process of negotiation and uh, that's how the consensual knowledge is produced. Of course, for a time being, this explanation would be uh, accepted, but again, maybe another explanation would, would replace this uh, later on. Scientific controversies become public controversies if the innovation poses risk to human beings and environment. Genetic engineering has generated public controversies across the countries on moral, social, economic and environmental grounds. Now, Dorothy Nelkin uh, looked at these controversies and she developed a typology of controversies. The first kind of controversy uh, is the disputes concerning the social, moral, religious implications of a scientific theory or practice. For example, genetic engineering technology is seen as tampering with natural forms of life and hence morally suspect. There can be several other examples. She also gives the example of teaching organic evolution and uh, people questioning uh, the teaching of organic evolution and insisting on teaching of creationist theory of uh, creationist theory as well. Surrogacy, use of uh, women to carry the embryos of couples for the growth and delivery of for a fee, use of animals or parts of animals in experiments, and these are challenged on moral ground, grounds. For example, use of animals for experiments. Uh, uh, several animal models are used in experiments like mice, like rats and uh, other animals, uh, <clears throat> rabbits included. And these are uh, challenged by people that it is not uh, moral to use these animals for experiments uh, and it is infringement of the animal rights. The second type of controversies are related to tension between environmental values and political or economic priorities. For example, industrial growth and environmental pollution, pollution of water, air and soil and consequences for uh, human and animal population. This is another uh, kind of uh, 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 tension that one finds. Uh, because industries release toxic gases into the air, thus polluting the air. Industries sometimes release uh, toxic wastes into the liquid wastes into the water, uh, rivers and streams. And some industries also release uh, <clears throat> solid wastes uh, into the soil and thus affecting the quality of air, water and soil, which are uh, the real life supporting systems of any uh, human population and also uh, life supporting systems of animal populations. The third type of controversy concerns health hazards 
associated with industrial and commercial practices resulting in clashes between economic interests and those people concerned about risk. These hazards tend to be invisible. That is just like examples of radiation from different sources, carcinogenic substances used as additives or preservatives of food in food. So, these are invisible kind of a, uh, 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 substances that are added and, and this may pose hazards. Like we keep hearing that cell phone towers emit radiation, cell phone uh, the radiation emitted by cell phone towers can cause uh, serious health problems for infants, children and sometimes the bird population around the area. This is still a kind of contested kind of a uh, uh, situation. Uh, some people say the cell phone towers, the radiation that comes from cell phone towers is uh, not going to affect the health of people, health of uh, animals because the dosage is low, but there are still controversies about it. The fourth type of controversy relates to tension between individual expectations and social or community goals on account of application of a particular technology. For example, we are familiar with the recent developments in the US uh, regarding the debate over gun, con gun control laws in the US. In the sense, we have seen several people using guns um, because it is easy to acquire guns in the US. They have been using guns for various antisocial activities, sometimes uh, killing school children uh, and, and so on. All this happens according to uh, Nelkin. All these controversies over science and technology represent, uh, in part, a loss of public trust, a declining faith in the representative institutions to serve the public interest. In the sense that the because science and technology are not regulated properly in the interests of the society at large, this kind of a loss of trust occurs in among members of the society about these institutions. Critics of science and technology ask the following questions. One, is science for the public or simply for the advancement of scientific careers? Second, are technological developments benefiting society or simply fulfilling narrow economic goals? So, these are the important questions that are being asked about new technologies that are being developed. Then how are these controversies resolved? Can we arrive at a consensus? It is a political challenge in a democratic, in all the democratic countries because all these countries are struggling to uh, come to a consensus on this uh, <coughs> contentious regarding uh, science and technology and their application in society. See, let me give an example here about the controversy over genetic engineering uh, in our country. The first and only genetically modified crop in India is cotton, that is Bt cotton. As I mentioned uh, some time back, Bt cotton seed is a proprietary seed of the Monsanto company. However, this Bt cotton seed was introduced in the year 2000, even before it was approved by the government of India. Then the government had to give a post facto approval as the farmer, farmers already planted illegally supplied Bt cotton seed by seed companies. As mentioned earlier, the Bt cotton seed has genetic material, a protein transferred from Bt that is Bacillus thuringiensis to protect the crop against bollworm. Today, uh, after the introduction of Bt cotton seed, today 80 percent of cotton cultivated in India is Bt cotton because it try it help farmers reduce the use of pesticide, repeated sprays of pesticide. And this, uh, in the introduction of Bt cotton raised several questions uh, in India. Let me talk about uh, what concerns were raised when Bt cotton, Bt seed was introduced to cotton, engineered into cotton plant. One, people uh, asked questions 
as what will happen to the cattle which eats the residues of Bt cotton plants, number one. Number two, what is the guarantee that the Bt cotton oil does not enter the market as it enter the market, number one, already there are signs in, uh, in some states that Bt cotton oil is being mixed with edible oil. That's how genetically modified substance or uh, genetically modified material, enter, plant material enters our uh, food chain. This has to be checked. There are reports that the Bt cotton oil is being mixed with edible oil. That has to be investigated, uh, uh, especially from Andhra Pradesh. We keep hearing this, it's happening. Next, following the introduction of Bt cotton, there were attempts to introduce Bt brinjal. Brinjal is a food crop. In the sense, before we move on to a uh, food crop, people said, first of all, what are the long-term implications of using uh, Bt cotton seed for the health of the soil, for the health of the uh, cattle, and also for uh, harmless insects that populate the fields, cotton fields, around the cotton fields. That means what are the environmental implications or consequences of introducing Bt cotton? Next, I said following the introduction of Bt cotton, there were attempts to introduce Bt brinjal, which is a food crop. We all know that brinjal is an important uh, vegetable uh, in Indian cuisine and also in preparation of Ayurvedic medicine. Brinjal is used in preparation of Ayurvedic medicine and brinjal is used in uh, Indian cuisine in variety of ways, right? And uh, India is the second largest producer of brinjal, next to China. One, of course, all that I was saying was about the nature of technology in the sense, the concerns regarding genetic modification of food are on two counts. One, the nature of technology and two, oh, control over technology. Regarding the nature of technology, as mentioned above, the questions were on safety and risks to human population, children, pregnant women, consequence and consequences for diversity of the crop that's genetically modified. The second concern is about the ownership of technology because the technology is owned by a multinational corporation which makes farmers dependent on the company every season and every time the company may increase the price. This is, in other words, raises the question of access. That is, as mentioned above, in poor countries, access to proprietary technology is a serious issue. For example, in our, let me give an example from our country. When the first generation of Bt cotton seed was introduced, the company fixed the price of a 400 grams packet of Bt cotton seed at 1700 rupees. And this was very, very expensive. Uh, people could not afford to buy this kind of a seed. Then they told the government, they reported to government that this, this is very, very expensive seed. And people are not able to buy this. Then the government had to intervene and use the existing legislation that is called MRTP legislation, Monopoly uh, Restrictive Trade Practices, Monopoly and Restrictive Trade Practices Act, to tell the company to reduce the price. Then the price was brought down to about uh, 400 rupees or 600 rupees per uh, 400 grams of. Uh, seed. And today what we have in the market is second generation Bt cotton seed. The company says the first generation Bt cotton seed is no longer effective in controlling the pests. The first generation Bt cotton seed uh, had one particular protein, toxic protein, and in the second generation they added one more protein, uh, toxic protein. Uh, and they said it is second generation Bt cotton seed which will work and farmers have to buy this uh, second generation Bt cotton seed. Although the first generation cotton seed was working in some states. Another issue is the consequence of genetic engineering for biodiversity. For example, sorry, the Bt brinjal may reduce 
diversity of brinjal. In India, we have over 200 varieties of brinjal uh, and there was one seminar organized in Kerala a few years ago. There, all these varieties were displayed, over 200 varieties of brinjal. And there is a, a possibility that BT brinjal will uh, displace all the varieties. It has already happened in the case of cotton. Today, we get only BT cotton seed, no other cotton seed, because the, for various reasons, uh, the other varieties of cotton, hybrid cotton have disappeared, conventional hybrid cotton seed have disappeared from the market. It's only BT cotton seed that is available. A similar thing may happen with BT brinjal. All varieties of brinjal may disappear, only BT brinjal may remain in the market. So there are several questions raised about safety and risk arising out of how safe is it to consume BT brinjal regularly. Because as I said, brinjal is a vegetable that is, being consu that is consumed almost regularly by every household in the country. And what are the implications for health of the people if they consume BT brinjal on a long term basis? So it is in this context uh, when there are several protests by farmers because on these grounds that the uh, number one, it is uh, it may cause health problems, it may cause uh, a loss of diversity of brinjal, it may cause their control over brinjal, brinjal seed. So far, they have been using brinjal seed repeatedly by saving it from one season to another. All this may disappear, and also express their concerns about the safety and risk, uh, the, the risks associated with BT. Uh, brinjal and, and the third thing that said they said was that if BT brinjal uh, comes into market all varieties will disappear and there will be monopoly control over brinjal uh, in the hands of the uh, company which owns the BT, C, BT gene. It is in this context uh, uh, for example the one of the important regulatory committees in our country is the Genetic Engineering Approval Committee or GEAC of the Ministry of Environment and Forests. And this committee recommended the commercial release of BT Brinjal. But the Mr. Dr. Jairam Ramesh said in the, in, the, in the light of the protests of the farmers and civil society organizations, he said he has to get the opinions of experts before actually uh, taking a decision on the uh, commercial release of BT Brinjal. Then he gathered opinions of experts and also conducted public hearings in seven cities in India during 2010. On the basis of the uh, inputs he received from the experts and a cross section of uh, people, Dr. Jairam Ramesh decided to impose a moratorium on the commercial introduction of BT Brinjal. He held that until further tests are done regarding safety, until further tests regarding safety are carried out by independent agencies, there will be a moratorium on the commercial introduction of BT Brinjal. Is it the same case in all countries regarding genetic, genetically modified food? If you look at different countries, the situation is uh, very different. For example, in the United States of America, genetically modified food is produced and consumed. They have genetically modified corn, BT corn, they have GM tomato, they have GM soybean and these, are, they, these have become part of agricultural commodities and people have been consuming this uh, genetically modified uh, 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 food, right? the corn, soybean and tomato. The US policy applies the principle of substantial equivalence between GM food and food produced by non-GM techniques like using hybrids, varieties, etc. The government policy does not make any distinction between food produced by genetically mo genetic modification or hybrid seed or varieties I just now mentioned. So that is how in the United States there is no uh, <coughs> uh, distinction between genetically modified food or uh, food produced by other methods and it is part of their uh, 
uh, part of their agricultural commodity market. So some Americans raised, we should label this uh, BT uh, products as genetically modified food crops like uh, BT, sorry, BT corn, uh, soybean and flavor saver tomato which is genetically modified. US Department of Agriculture has a committee to look at these genetic modification and some of the committee members uh, when this was put before the committee to decide or to recommend uh, whether or not to rec whether or not to label genetically modified foods some of them said by labeling them you are telling that this food is somehow very different from non genetically or uh, food produced by non genetic methods non genetic engineering methods or food produced by traditional methods that means by labeling you are telling the consumers that look this food is somehow different whereas we as I said, the, the principle of substantial equivalence uh, indicate that there is no difference between the two. When we say that there is no difference between the two, uh, genetically modified food and food produced by traditional methods, why should we label? It can be misleading. But in Europe, the members of the society insist on labeling. Number one, first they oppose genetically modified food and second, a, all products that are sold in the market must be labeled whether or not it contains genetically modified ingredients. Of course, today every uh, supermarket that sells uh, any food uh, products or intermediary food, food products uh, have to indicate what are the ingredients that these food related products have. Right? That is why in Europe they say that we do not want genetically modified food because genetic modification is something against nature, something against uh, natural forms of life and some people also go to the extent of saying you are playing God by modifying the genetic makeup of the plants. That means you are changing the integrity of the plants by introducing genes from other uh, species. That is why in Europe genetically modified food is not produced or consumed. Uh, this is one of the important tensions between Europe and the US. The US wants to export a lot of its GM corn, GM uh, soybean to Europe and Europe refuses to uh, import these things because they are genetically modified. In India also, uh, genetically modified food is not produced or consumed yet. But as I said, the BT Brinjal debate has uh, led to the moratorium on commercial introduction of BT brinjal which is a genetically modified food. I said uh, there are differences in the attitude and towards uh, use of uh, genetically modified food in different countries. As I said United States of America genetically modified food is produced and consumed. Genetically modified corn, GM tomato and GM soybean have, been, have become part of agricultural commodities. The US policy applies the principle of substantial equivalence between genetically modified food and food produced by non-GM techniques. The government policy does not uh, make any distinction between food produced by genetic modification or by, or by hybrid seed or varieties. In Europe genetically modified food is not produced and consumed. In India also genetically modified food is not produced and consumed. Now why this differences? Why in some countries uh, this has been accepted and in other countries uh, the genetically modified food has not been accepted? So in India the resistance against genetically modified food or genetic modification of food, food crops comes from the, some of the religious considerations. For example, Muslims do not consume any food that has genetic material transferred from organisms prohibited for consumption by Islam. Hindus object any food that contains genetic material from cow as the animal is sacred in uh, their life. The second refers to uh, control over technology. The, the first two points I raised is about the nature of technology. The second point I am I'm going to talk about is corporate control of technology and consequences. 
one important consequence is access. Farmers need to have access to complete information regarding practices associated with cultivating genetically modified crops and the cost of seed. Sometimes uh, farmers do not get complete information about the package of genetically modified food, food crop cultivation. This can create uh, problems for them in spite of the extension work that's being uh, carried out by the seed companies which uh, produce this genetically modified seed. The second thing that can happen uh, with uh, the control over the seed uh, by the multinational corporations or big industrial corporations is the idea of plant obsolescence. Plant obsolescence refers to rendering old stock of seed deliberately obsolete or old varieties of seed or old hybrids of seed uh, deliberately, they, may, they are made deliberately obsolete. Plant obsolescence is practiced by uh, industries in general that make consumer durables and industries that produce automobiles. In order to keep the business going, they make older models of the products obsolete. We will not get spare parts for our old fridges or old motor cars. Then we are made to buy new models, new uh, uh, models of these products. In the sense that because the planned obsolescence is built into this uh, kind of uh, production, because uh, one of the uh, strategies of planned obsolescence is to use very inexpensive material so that the 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 goods that are produced uh, do not last long, so that the, the customers can go back to the shop to buy a new product. So uh, planned obsolescence can be deliberately planned obsolescence is a deliberate strategy of the uh, companies to keep the business going and make the customers return to them after some time to buy a new uh, model of the uh, products. Similarly, in the case of Bt cotton seed, the first generation Bt cotton seed is replaced by the second generation Bt cotton seed as according to the company that owns Bt cotton seed, the pest developed resistance against the first generation Bt toxin. So the company came to the conclusion based on the company's crop surveillance staff in Gujarat in 2006 and 7. The company saw this as an opportunity to introduce the second generation Bt cotton seed which the company had already produced, which already it had uh, in the shells. It's a fact that the resistance against Bt toxin breaks down as the pest adapts itself to Bt toxin or undergoes uh, mutation. That is, the pest and host co-evolve and if the host does something, pest also tries to do something because it is an intelligent organism. So this struggle continuously goes on in nature. The host pest interaction is always a struggle and the companies which produce Bt cotton seed uh, also have to keep on adding more and more toxins or toxin, toxic material, toxic genes, uh, which, can, which, which is going to fight the pest, which, is, uh, which tries to develop resistance against this uh, toxin. The notion of risk is built into uh, cultivation of this genetically modified food. As uh, I just now said, what is the guarantee that the Bt seed that is planted will give yields? What are the kinds of uh, steps that they have to take to see that the yields are guaranteed and the risk is minimized? Risk here refers to potential harm to life or property in the sense that Cultivating any crop for that matter involves some risk. And in the case of Bt uh, crops, the risk is uh, at a higher level because it's a new technology. No action is risk free. Our attempt should be to minimize the risk. The important questions regarding risk are one, what is the acceptable level of, level of risk that we should take? Uh, second is, what is the time frame over which a given technology is safe? 
that is the first question refers to how does one decide what is the acceptable level of tech, uh, risk. Generally decisions with respect to acceptable level of risk always involves a trade off between competing and sometimes conflicting values. Then who takes the decision in deciding on what is the acceptable level of risk. When I refer to uh, conflicting uh, values, for example, the farmers wants, for example, farmers want safe technology, whereas uh, farmers want a te technology that is at an affordable price, whereas the companies would like to sell it at a higher price. Sometimes uh, uh, there are conflicting interests, that is, the interest can be, uh, the particular seed, a particular kind of technology may be uh, uh, beneficial to some sections of the society, but it may be harmful to the environment. So in that case, how does one decide what is the acceptable level of risk? Uh, as I said, it involves always a trade-off between competing and sometimes conflicting values and who the, somebody has to make a decision where or at what level we should accept this kind of a risk. And these uh, decisions obviously involve uh, expertise, obviously involve at level political policy makers and of course the people who are going to use this technology. The time frame over which the pest will develop resistance, the company that produces Bt cotton seed should inform the farmers about the breakdown of the, about the possibility of breakdown of resistance and the need for introducing new seeds. This somehow is not uh, this information is not given to farmers a priori uh, before actually selling this Bt seed. Now it is this which causes uh, worries and uh, there is a need for regulation of genetic engineering technologies. Genetic engineering technologies is a supply driven technologies. Uh, how can one regulate such technologies? Technology needs to be regulated for ensuring safety of people and environment and we must have a regulatory mechanism that must be broad based and democratic. How does one ensure that regulatory mechanism is broad based and democratic at different levels? That is why we uh, talk about open source innovations uh, in the context of agriculture. This open source innovation uh, has been, the idea of open source innovation has been borrowed from software development uh, where we have the open source software today and the open source software means that the code in which the software is written is made public so that people can contribute to the development of software further. Similarly, open source innovation agriculture should be made, should be uh, produced in such a way that the farmers are involved in the innovation process right from the beginning. To minimize the cost and to enable community to participate in the innovation process, open source innovation should be explored. Genomics based marker assisted selection technology holds the promise for solving the problems related to agriculture. The marker assisted selection technology involves transfer of genetic material from one variety of one variety of a crop to another variety of the same crop or species within a species this is uncontroversial as it does not involve transfer of genes across taxonomic groups such as for example transferring a gene from bacillus thuringiensis uh, into cotton or brinjal further the uh, markers that are used are not subject to patent laws. In India, already there are examples of deployment of marker assisted selection for rice crop uh, improvement. The case of the collaboration between Directorate of Rice Research, now renamed as Indian Institute of Rice Research Hyderabad and the Center for Molecular and Cellular Biology in Hyderabad, uh, they collaborated in a project to use marker-assisted selection for rice crop improvement. Thank you.